Well, welcome to another day where we get to talk with the wonderful ministry marketplace leader practitioner on the practical tool that will help you in your nonprofit and your ministry. And so today I have the honor of talking with someone who I found just very interesting in one of my meetings, my first meetings with him. And this is Alex Kim, who is former executive of Enterprise Solutions in uh, for smart cities. So Alex, welcome. Hi, nice to meet you again, uh, Tommy. Thank you. Hey, Alex, just before we begin, and today we're going to talk a little about about innovation and why we're going to the process dynamics of innovation. Before we do, can you share a little bit about yourself and your journey, Alex? Sure. Well, you know, I'm a, a child of an immigrant, um, grew up in the States ever since I was 11 and then just traveled the world around, you know, background, uh, military career as a naval officer, all the way to automotive companies to last 10 years, really plus years in uh, Asia, uh, doing lots of uh, activities, in smart cities and uh, securities and digital world. And uh, I'm just uh, loving every life. And uh, now I'm uh, residing in the uh, Chicago area and I uh, had a pleasure meeting you. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I was also very interested in one of your part of your resume. You were an uh, innovation fellow at the University of Michigan. What was that like and what did you do during this that time? Well, you know, it was a really amazing time of my own transformation where I learned the art and science behind, you know, what innovation is. And I actually dedicated, you know, a full time to that. And the fellowship center around, you know, innovating, uh, uh, specifically domain that I, I was uh, learning through was uh, medical innovation. But really this uh, applies to uh, business and life and uh, ministry and, you know, just everything in general. Got it. And so during, like, for instance, if you look back at your journey, what made you decide to go to University of Michigan? Was there something about being an innovation fellow that attracted you or was it a job requirement that, that will help you? Well, I realized, uh, you know, uh, out in the marketplace for a long time and it seems like, you know, whether you're competing against your competitors in terms of, uh, uh, you know, business ideas, products or even pitching uh, ideas to clients how everybody pretty much sounded the same, you know, and I realized that, wow, you know, without really uh, learning to grasp of this uh, art of innovation, right, especially as we're uh, fastly uh, transitioning into a digital world, you know, how re you really need to change to really kind of reinvent yourself to continue to be relevant uh, in the society. So yeah. that's one of the reasons why I, I you know, I decided to really go, uh, go to that. You talk about your extensive experience, uh, not only in the U.S., but in Asia. What cities have you lived in in, uh, in Asia, Alex? Um, so uh, I basically travel throughout the, uh, you know, everything from Japan, Australia, all the way to India. But I specifically lived in um, Singapore, Shanghai, and Korea as a permanent residence. But uh, basically, you just travel throughout. For those who are listening in on both the LA as well as Chicago markets, is Alex, I, I brought him in because of his extensive experience in different cities and also his idea of teaching on the basic foundations of innovation. Tomorrow, we're gonna look at part two by doing a round table with practical ministry leaders talking about this topic. But for today, I wanted Alex to talk through some of those basic ideas of innovation for your organization. Here's why we're doing this. We talk about practical tools. And so a lot of times organizations, nonprofit and ministry, suddenly have to change their strategies. Your five-year strategies are out the window. Your one-year strategy, your six-month strategy is out the window. You're dealing with cash flow. You're pivoting from everything that some of you are doing. Some of you guys are completely moving all of your work, mentoring, face-to-face -face events, all the way to online. Is that going to last? How do you innovate new ideas? How do you decide which ideas to use? How do you test it? So that's where I'm hoping, Alex, through your work, your seminar today, you will solve all of the problems for all the ministries that will be listening to this. <laughs> I think you're too generous, but I think if, any, you know, if I can help in any way to really... Uh, you know, help someone along in their ministry, it will be my, uh, you know, dream come true. So Yeah. And, but, and, you know, 
and Alex, I mean, even as we talk, you live in Northbrook, you attend a church, and yeah. there is one thing about just volunteering at church, and but we are taking your skills, your experience, mm-hmm. professor, marketplace leaders, your experience, your education at the University of Michigan, all of these, and then applying it to a problem that these ministries and nonprofit has. And so it's great, even though a lot of times you're not a pastor, but this is how God has designed you to take those skills to apply it for a gospel setting. Well, it would be my pleasure to really help um, with my content here to really help uh, somebody in that journey. Yeah, so it's my pleasure and thank you for inviting me. Thank you, Alex. With that said, I am gonna disappear but I'm still going to operate your PowerPoint. And then from that point on, I will come back after you're done for some Q and a. Okay. Sure. Thank you. All right. So as soon as I uh, remove myself, you can start teaching and I will control the PowerPoint. Okay. Thank you. Well, hello everybody. Again, uh, it's just my pleasure seeing everybody. Uh, Although I cannot see you, but uh, virtually uh, we are all in one, uh, one in Christ. And uh, I hope, Today, I'm just trying to uh, help with a little bit of knowledge that I know about innovation and see, you know, how I can help you uh, along your journey uh, in your ministry, in your life in general. So um, I just want to talk about today, really, the state of the world and the new order that we are embracing. Uh, There's many things that's been happening. So, um, you know, uh, if we could go to page two, Tommy, then uh, I'll go ahead and start my uh, um, uh, content here or the um, speaking uh, so here, uh, first I want to lead with, uh, again, my, a lot of my knowledge comes from uh, business world. And so, but of, of course, I center around innovation. And um, I really want to kind of emphasize some of the key things that we could maybe translate that into our ministry and in our gospel uh, ministry. So if we start looking at the companies in general, right, you could see from this chart, you know, back in the 50s, the average lifespan of a Fortune 500 company was 60 years. Rolled into 90s, 15 years, right? Now we're talking, you know, uh, less than 10 years. And McKinsey, according to McKinsey study, 75% of these big companies are going to be gone by tw- uh, year 2027. So really, this should be an eye opener, whether it's a Fortune 500 company or a mega church or any other organizations. Think about how fast things are evolving so quickly. And we're going to delve into why you know, these things are happening. And if you're a startup, so to speak, right, in a business world, you'd be lucky if you survive, you know, uh, two, three years in general, right? So really, this is kind of the eye opener as, as we kind of uh, delve into the innovation side of the business as well as in in a uh, ministry. Next uh, page, please. So when you look at innovation, really, uh, in general, people look at it from a very uh, kind of four distinct perspective. Some people call it more of a random event where a lot of the venture capital companies try to bet on that, you know, one home run out of the 10 companies that they're sponsoring. And some argue that, hey, it's all about research, you know, how much R&D or how much really things that you put into that really kind of eventually will pan out in the future, right? Some may argue also that um, it's not about technology, it's about marketing, you know, it's about the business plan. It's about how you really present and try to commercialize the ideas or the concept or the products that you have. And some may view it as it's about a process, right? Approach where you follow along and, and view it more as a journey. Of course, there are many different views, but obviously, you know, there's no right answer, right? Let's go to the next page where we could talk about here. Really, it comes down to when it comes to innovation, it's the problem is the knowledge, right? If you look at it from a start of the man, you know, how much uh, knowledge we have amassed versus more recently as we are entering into fully into digital age, the new knowledge that's created by individuals, enterprise, community, businesses, churches, organizations are just going exponentially, right? The problem is that we have such a plethora and there's an influx of all this new uh, knowledge and largely driven by digital 
medium, right? Whether it's a, a smart media, social media, all kinds of IoT sensors, you know, all these informations being exploding out in the marketplace. The problem is the utilization of these new knowledge is just something that everybody's grappling with, right? So the AI is being developed to really try to help us with that. But at the same time, you know, a lot of people think that the amount of knowledge that's created between now, right, and 2050, would essentially will exceed the knowledge created, you know, in the uh, history of mankind. So as we have this huge influx of data and knowledge, you know, how we how are we going to digest all this and start utilizing it and creating value, right? That's the problem right now we're grappling with. Next page, please. So really then the big question is, what is innovation? Let's start with there, right? A, a simple first kind of uh, understanding of what that is. So if we go to uh, page six, right? The innovation is really about process, well, it's actually adoption and the value, okay? It's about the process of really understanding and creating all these experiences and you know effects or the technology effects that people really find it valuable but ultimately it's about adapting those uh, products or services or ideas right and more importantly really transforming those knowledges that we just talked about into a real value right in business world we call that in forms of you know money we we measure that, whether it's a stock price, whether it's a revenue, whether it's a profit, right? So I want to kind of give you a quote from this uh, gentleman named, uh, actually, Dr. Nicholson from 3M. He's actually the, the grandfather, the father of the post-it notes, right? He said, research is the transformation of money, and I put in there, time into knowledge, but innovation is transformation of knowledge into money, well, I would like to replace that with value, right? That people value, right? And we know that innovation is not about just simple inventing, right? That's a start. Or coming up with good ideas. Again, it's a start. Nor is it just problem solving or being creative. Nor is it a cool technology or a design or a gadget, right? It's really, if I can really convey one thing to everybody, is really it's about adoption and transforming the knowledge into value. I think that's where we need to start with. Okay. Um, next page, please. So everybody knows Apple, right? And transformation began with uh, you know, Steve saying, hey, think different, right? Here we are, a long time ago, it was a desktop company. And who would have thought, as we speak right now, that Apple is helping me balance my budget because I'm using their Apple uh, you know, um, credit card and it just neatly just categorizes everything for me to balance my daily, monthly expenses. And tomorrow, uh, very soon, it's gonna help me open cars for me through my iPhone, right? Again from a desktop company to what Apple is now, even though he has passed away, right? The transformation is obvious and is, it's just monumental, right? But in the Christian perspective then, if you guys recall, right? Nicodemus came in the uh, middle of the night, right? And then Jesus said, in order to be, you know, uh, reach the kingdom of heaven, he said, you know, you gotta be born again. And Nicodemus just like, saying, what do you mean born again, right? And Jesus' challenge to all of us is, are you born again, right? Nicodemus or Alex. And basically, Jesus is challenging all of us to really transform our minds, right? The way he sent his only son to really through the mercy and grace and rest is history as to how we need to think like Jesus, right? So let's go to the next page. And really if we could be more specific about then innovation is all about adoption uh, 
Michael Schrag actually uh, explained it really well right here, right? The uh, exp explanation or the definition, right? Is adopting something that means accept it, embrace it, and use it, right? Use it. So it's, uh, it's you know, think about it this context, right? In that sense, adoption, if that's a scorecard, right? Then Jesus, I would argue, will be the greatest innovator of all time, right? Even after the you know three years of short ministry, two thousand years back, today, I would say at minimum we have two billion followers around the world, right? Embracing and adopting his way of life, right? In that sense, so really, um, you know, going back to uh, Michael here, uh, saying really nothing happens until something gets bought or adopted or used, right? And really, innovation is not really innovation until customers or clients or users really adopt. And, and it's not a self-designated uh, term. Just because I say I'm an innovator does not mean I'm an innovator. It's the, the scorecard is other people adopting your product, your service, your ideas, right? and embracing it, you know, throughout the, the long periods of time. That's really what innovation is about. So if I can really leave away with the one sentence, it's innovation is all about adoption. Uh, next page, please. So digging a little bit deeper into then what is adoption is really in terms of scorecard, right? So again, let's, since uh, we're on the Apple topic here or the example, I would argue back in 2007, iPhone was not only a category killer, but it was a blockbuster innovation. And uh, typically speaking, it's less than 1% of any new ideas or products like that really uh, be successful, like as such as the iPhone, right? But even iPhone becomes incremental. So if you can see you know from original iphone to now what, what are you up to now in, in in this fall it will be iphone 12. so that's a 12th iteration of a product replacement or or incremental innovation rather than blockbuster innovate innovation right but sad to say most of the new products or ideas really fail right 90 95 percent will actually will not make it to that we call it the 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 value of the shadow of death, right? So in terms of ministry also, then we need to think in the context of, okay, if the scorecard is adoption, right? What are the fruits of my transformation, maybe perhaps my ministry? And, you know, how, is, how are they bearing fruits? Are people that I'm, you know, witnessing to, addressing to, you know, are they adopting what I'm trying to convey to them? Yes? So if we go to the next page, 10. So now then speak a little bit more about then who innovates, right? Who are the innovators, right? What are some characteristics or the persona of these innovators, right? I would argue innovator really truly understand not the current mind of consumers or ad adopters, but the mind of the future. Like if you're asked, right, uh, 15 years ago, do a market study and say, you know, concept of, uh, of an iPhone, people would not be able to articulate that concept, right? Steve Jobs and the crew actually thought in advance for us the mind of the future consumer, yes? And Steve Jobs knew and understood the technology's effect on what is possible and how these things make a difference, you know, as a smartphone, right? How that's going to really impact the end users going forward, okay? So, Innovators understand and envision the new future and how to really get there. Yes, sometimes it's an iteration and multiple iterations, but they have the vision 
and the eyes on the horizon. Okay? And also importantly that most innovators desire impact. Okay? And it's not always all about money, right? And if you ask Apostle Paul, perhaps he understood this concept, right? You know, when he had that his own transformation, he understood taking risk for the gospel and bearing fruits for the born again, right? As a born again Christian, right? He was in a shipwreck, flogged, in jail, right? Uh, just chased out of cities, bootstrap, budgeting to go plum, uh, place to place, just like Lewis and Clark. He knew about taking risk. But more importantly, he had an intense desire for the gospel's impact to the society, right? To the Gentiles. Let's go to the next page. You guys all know Picasso, right? He definitely was an innovator, right? You can see from his picture at age of 14, he was already a, a prodigy, you know, in terms of art, right? And he got bored. And then, but after, you know, um, trying different concepts and really opening his eyes and thinking out of the box, he's the one who came up with this concept called cubism, right? But that idea really didn't declare a cornerstone of uh, modern art until recently. And you can see from his uh, quote there, it took me four years to paint like Raphael, but a lifetime to paint like a child, right? And the, why child? Because child always thinks out of the box. Nothing's in, in a box, right? Even Jesus says, you know, to enter the kingdom of heaven, you got to have a childlike faith, right? Throw away all the rules and regulations and think in a pure sense. Let's go to the next page. So where does this innovation happen then? Maybe, you know, what is kind of like the framework or the perhaps the, you know, the process of how we should look at things, right? So if you can think of like from, uh, from left to right here, you have an idea or a ministry idea or a concept or perhaps a product, right? You see a what I call uh, unmet needs and desires, right? So uh, typically, you know, let's say you come out with uh, post-it notes, there must be a, some kind of unmet needs or desires that the Dr. Nicholson saw that, that he wanted to really uh, discover and, you know, find opportunities for. Typically in, in, in the innovation world, when there's a workaround or somebody jerry-rigging, that's an immediate sign, telltale sign saying, hey, we need to look this into further. Why is this person jerry-rigging or, you know, changing things around from an original product or uh, original process? There must be an additional need that we're not satisfying through that, right? Here, from that perspective, when the opportunity like that happens, we have to think very divergently, as very open-minded as possible, right? And explore every open mind uh, solution possible, really understanding about that specific needs and desires and why, 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 right? Ask five times, like a child. Once we clearly understand that, then we need to start converging again to pick out the best ideas or the best concept that we need we need to really kind of go through the uh, process elimination. This is where you need really the wisdom of crowd. Instead of one person looking at it, people looking at it from very different angle, you know, as divergent perspective as possible. At the same time, we have to start thinking about the solution space. So that's where as we're Diver from diverging ideas to now converging on ideas, one or two or three key ideas or the concept that we want to hone in on, we have to go as divergent as possible on number of possible solutions to solve or address that unmet need or desire. So you can see in the middle, that circle is where that 
those two divergent as well as the convergent ideas meet through the wisdom of crowd. And then we finally then start selecting the best solution to take it to, to the ministry or the marketplace, right? So broadly speaking, there is an opportunity exploration phase. There is an opportunity assessment phase. There is a solution identification phase, which happens simultaneously along with that. And then finally, we have the implement, uh, implementation validation phase. And it could be for some people as short as three months all the way to a couple of years, depending on the, the complexity and the scale of the idea and the concept. Okay, let's go to the next page. So really, if you step back and look at it, right? A lot of people argue it takes 300 ideas to really make one really implementable uh, success innovation, okay? It's obviously you gotta keep at it, but from an exploration to really, um, fine tuning and, and you know, from the previous uh, process, it's many jump right from idea to implementation, but really once you follow that process that we just described, you have to continue to explore, pivot, come back, and then go through that process through the wisdom of crowd. Next page, please. So more specifically then the dynamics of how that happens is front end, you have these concept ideas phase. And then, you know, the, uh, in the business world, we call it new product development phase, right? And then as you do a, a quick launch, whether you find the lead customer or lead market or lead community that you want to test out your um, concept, the speed and the speed of adoption is very important uh, scorecard to keep an eye on. And then quickly assess whether, uh, are you making traction and you think this is gonna, in route to become a blockbuster or it's gonna be a failure. And then as you fail more and more and you pivot, then eventually, hopefully you'll uh, land on something that hopefully will be uh, a, a blockbuster, right? And again, the telltale, telltale sign is the increase in adoption and the rate of adoption. All right, page 15, please. So as we go then into thinking about all this, really, some people may argue innovation is, you know, you have to be born with it, right? But I would argue innovation can be learned, right? And I think the successful innovators really Learn to think differently, right? Always staying hungry and humble, but at the same time, thinking out of the box, right? As Jesus did, as Steve Jobs did. Focus on also connecting the dots, right? How the technology effect and the opportunity, or the, the issue that you need that you need to address how to really merge the two and be able to, you know, order, uh, so to speak, solve that issue, okay? And I think the successful innovators really minimize their personal bias by interacting with others and understanding what others are choosing and really embracing on this concept called wisdom of crowd. Okay, seeing it from their perspective, as many different angles as possible. And this relentless pursuit of unearthing the new needs, the unmet needs, it's important differentiator is not the current need, but the unmet needs or the future desires that, that even the customers or the user can, uh, themselves cannot tell us, right? Almost like a inside of an eye of an eagle who can see beyond the waters to go and grab that fish, you know, way above the sky. Let me go to the next page. Um, it's really innovation about, it's, it's really about a journey, right? 
you know, if you can think of what you're doing right now, whether it's a ministry or organization that you are um, part of or heading up, think of it as a castle, right? That's where you are now. But in order to be an innovator, you have to think above and beyond that, right? And think of ships going out to the beyond the horizon, right? Whether it's a Magellan or Columbus, how you explore and discover, right? And you have to understand also that some ships never launch. Some ships, you know, uh, never gets to be built well. And some ships are going to be lacking direction. And that's the reality. But the possibility, right, of looking beyond and keeping the eyes on the prize, right? Whether it was Apostle Paul or Lewis and Clark or Steve Jobs, right? Really, all of us have to kind of think in terms of journey and knowing all the minds and the obstacles that we're going to be going through. In the innovation community, you know, we also sometimes call it um, jockey and the horse, right? Jockey being the entrepreneurs, the horses being the, the business model or business themselves. So, you know, that's, I guess I would uh, similarly then equate to, you know, missionaries or the uh, the ministry leaders versus actual ministries themselves, right? Jockey and the horse. You have to really think about um, in that context, are you embracing uh, what is reality versus what is possible? And you can never discover unless you go out of your own castle, out of your own framework, knowing that the, your ships, right? are going to be um, shipwrecked, perhaps, just like what Apostle Paul exp uh, experienced. Let's go to the next page. I know we need to hurry up here now. So why should I learn to innovate, right? Oh, because <laughs> it's such an important new life skill that we all have to embrace because the world around us is changing, okay? We know that Western world has already evolved from agricultural society to now what we call digital economy. Develop, de developing worlds are already you know, rapidly catching up and partially due to internet and digital medium, right? And I would argue, and many would argue, that creative class are those ones that are thinking out of the box in a new ways to create value. They're the ones who's really gonna change and lead the next digital age, right? And I don't know if you guys know, heard of uh, BSF International, which I've been um, part of for a very long time. Here's an organization, right? Up till a few years ago, they required men to wear pants, ladies to wear um, skirts to the classes. They would not share the actual notes, class notes, unless you came and attended the class. Now, fast forward to, to the, today, I, they just launched this uh, app called Word Go, where anybody can start your own Bible study using this app geared towards people who, uh, especially the younger uh, segment or the younger age people. But this transcends time zones, geography, you know, ethnic background, your, you know, just really, it's incredible to see even a old organization, you know, a conservative organization like BSF International, embracing and changing for the new digital age. Especially this was apparent as we went through the pandemic, how important these new innovations and the tools are, right? New service, new ways of really reaching out to the, the loss, right? Or to the uh, believers and the non-believers. Next, go to the, uh, let's go to the next page. So we know world around us is changing, right? And we know that our education system, uh, societal systems are not ready to really help prepare all of us to win the battle as new innovators, okay? But, you know, when we look at what makes a good innovation or innovators, right? We know that these are some of the key things that we need to take on as a new life skill sets, right? 
as innovators, we have to all become good at collaborating, right? Synthesizing different opportunities, connecting things that create value. Being able to use creativity and passion to really personalize and give that personal touch to your organization, to the people that you come in uh, contact with. A great way, uh, also localizers who have uh, amazing skills to really create this new local value. What works in Jakarta may, may not work in Chicago, right? So how do we then be able to translate that same transformation in, in the local context? So as the world is changing, are you equipped for gospel innovation, right? Just like the great example I gave about PSF International. Next page, please. So your opportunity is endless, in my opinion. All of us should think that way, right? So as, as you kind of settle back and think about and ref, ref, reflect, what are your best opportunities that perhaps maybe you could kind of consider and think through? What change do you want to make in this world, in your world, right? Whether it's your job, organization, or community, or beyond, right? And really, it's about getting started, doing something about it, right? Understanding the effects of the technology, whether it be that, or understanding and building the knowledge community that what you know as a platform, and then who do you know? How do you connect with those people? How do you bring together communities, right? Communicating with people, the desires and the needs, again, the unmet needs, how to organize, analyze information that you discover, like a Lewis and Clark. What are the possible futures that you want to achieve and understanding those key elements? And what are you gonna learn, right, to make actionable decisions that you could apply to make an impact like Apostle Paul. So if we go to my last page, really I wanna leave you with my final perspective. We all know who Mother, Mother Teresa is, right? We uh, are just blessed to see her lifelong ministry and her perspective of my heart belongs to God, but my body belongs to people, right? From her little girl, uh, transformation from her heart perspective to really bearing fruits of the spirit. And of course, one of my favorite um, verses, uh, James 2.26, right? Body without spirit is dead, but so is faith without deeds is also dead. So I think I want to just leave you with that perspective. And I thank you for, uh, you know, just uh, allowing me to share this uh, concept with you. And uh, I hope the best of luck in all your ministries. Thank you. Can hear. Tommy, can you turn it? Yeah. Yeah, Alex, I'm going to keep it on this slide, your opportunity, because I want to talk with you a little bit about that. Let's go through two scenarios. Let's go to the young or the medium-sized organization where they don't have a lot of staff. They have a uh, executive director. And so now they got it. They want to be innovative. They want to constantly be changing. They want to constantly be reacting to different things. How do they start? Does he, does this individual executive director or president of a medium sized organization, should they meet with their team every week to look at opportunities? Should they have some set time to do that? And then at what point do they launch ideas? Do they have a volunteer to help out? Do, do they need to hire a Full, uh, a part-time staff de dedicated. What's your uh, opinion, thoughts? Sure, uh, great question. How about we go to uh, page 12 and then I'll, I'll uh, continue to talk about that. So really, to be honest, there's no right way or the wrong way, right? It's really about the intense desire to really commit to this process. And I think page 12 is could be kind of like a framework of how whether you're a small, you know, a five-person organization or 
you know, thousand person organization, really embracing this idea of openly inviting people to come up with ideas, identify the unmet needs and the future desires of that community or that organization or that um, project that you're working on. And then whether you call it a weekly meeting or a monthly or something that's regularly scheduled to discuss and kind of flesh out from a very different divergent thinking perspective. And then you start having a, a agree process to leverage the wisdom of crowd to start narrowing it down to one or two or three or four or five key ideas or best uh, concepts to move forward with it and having this kind of uh, mindset in mind as long as you are committed to this i think you'll be so you it requires a discipline at the uh, commitment and discipline at the same time open mind to really uh, uh use this as a journey hey and Al, going with what you were just saying you mentioned four or five ideas is four or five ideas too much should you just go with one idea and see where it goes and then go to the next idea or can you balance two or three ideas at once so you know again i would you know i would try to collect as many ideas as possible right okay. it could be 50 it could be 100 it could be 300 plus depending on the size of the organization as well as you know the enthusiasm of the individuals once you narrow it down to let's say five I will pick one or two to really start taking it all the way through, right? And then once that one or two doesn't pan out, then you pivot immediately to either change that or come back to that five that you initially thought as a, a best ideas, right? So I would have some kind of uh, process in place to think about it in that context. And then as a budget gets better or organization gets bigger, then of course then you could take on more ideas. Got it. Hey, I'm looking at this next, that second one, opportunity space. Okay, let's say I'm an organization that is passing out Bibles in their another country, or I'm working with under-resourced people, but then at the same time, I hear about this good idea. For instance, I have this friend who loves creating beehives, and through that, he makes honey. And mm -hmm. so I'm sitting there, huh, I think I can make some money through beehives, but it has nothing to do with my organization. Good idea or bad idea, Alex? Should I even entertain it? Because it has nothing to do with my organization. There's no such thing as bad ideas. Okay. We have to, again, at the front end phase, we have to be as open-minded as possible, but at the same time, allow different people to have different perspectives to maybe, you know, argue and discuss actively through the wisdom of crowd to narrow it down again you know, whether that beehive idea is good or bad. In got the it. Of the overall vision. Got it, got it. How does, for a lot of these innovation is, for ministries, they also got to think about budget. They got to think about what the return is. How yeah. does potential funding play a role in your thinking? Exactly. So that's why, you know, whether it's a bootstrap uh, budget or, you know, maybe a little bit more comfortable in terms of, uh, you know, sponsor budget, you know, you have to make critical decision and rank them so that there is a some type of a process of uh, elimination. Even let's say, you know, Apple's got billions of budget. Maybe your ministry has maybe, you know, a couple thousand dollars at yeah. that. You still have to go through and weed out and pick the one or two or three or four or five that you really want to embrace and go with it. So you have to have, again, wisdom of crowd to to be able to have that uh, process and trust the process. All right, Alex, let me throw a, a, a scenario to you. What if I'm a executive director or president and so and speak to the leaders? Sometimes leaders are so caught up in their idea that mm -hmm. they just aren't open to uh, disagreements. And so I say to you, Alex, you know what? I prayed about it. The Lord has placed that on my heart. Yeah, I'm, I just really feel strong for this idea. Everyone on the team is saying, this is a bad idea, but I feel really strong. What's your opinion to them? What, what would you say to them? Well, I think you got to know when to let go. And let, we have to know also, just like a church, right? Some are great at evangelizing. Some are great at teaching and preaching. You know, it's a biblical, right? We all, head cannot be toe, toe cannot be hand. 
we also have to know if I'm, I, I'm good at idea generating, I may not be good at implementing, you know? So we all have to know the strengths and weaknesses of each other within an organization. And then again, trust each other to take it to the next level. And, and so if I'm good at just idea generation, hey, let, you know, let's continue to hone in on that at the same time, maybe, you know, doing other things and let other people perhaps allow them to implement your ideas. You, you know? touched on one thing I want to dig in. You mentioned time to let go. What are the signs that causes you to say, I got to let go of this idea? Well, I think adoption wise or even adopting your idea wise, it's, it's not picking up steam and it's harder and harder to really get going. I think then, you know, have a reflection on, you know, what are the, some of the, seeing it from their perspective, other people's perspective, why is it not making traction, right? So really innovation is all about really understanding those dynamics and being able to pivot and, and willing to, you know, have a grip at the same time, flexibility, almost like a bamboo stick, you know, like a, you know, I do kendo and, you know, the kendo stick or the bamboo stick is, it never breaks, but it's flexible enough to, you know, take that changes in place. Yeah. Hey, and we're, in some sense, Alex, I know we're talking about this with ministry as well as nonprofits, and this applies to business, but this actually applies to churches too, who constantly need to innovate. Wouldn't you say that? Absolutely. I think, I think churches are in probably dire straits more so because buildings and the ministries that they are involved with are oftentimes it's a fixed assets and fixed costs that you cannot overnight change, you know, and think about what just happened in, in the pandemic. How relevant are those million dollar, you know, buildings, right? Nobody's going there. Yeah. Right. So how do you pivot from there? How do you change? How do you change? It? So, again, I think churches, I think, could be in the in my opinion, also could be uh, hit with a lot of these unknowns in the future. And they are probably at very, very vulnerable stage. Yeah. And I find a lot of times, Alex, being in the ministry uh, business world and not ministry, and you'll probably say the same thing is. A lot of times I would say pastors like you and our ministry leaders are so tied into their ideas. They say, okay, this is what God has placed us in. And when bad things come, we got to stay with the plan. We got to continue to remain faithful through these trials. <laughs> but you, <coughs> we got to change. Yeah. So again, going back to the, uh, you know, the picture about castle versus ships, right? You know, how long are you going to remain in castle? And perhaps, you know, for hundred years, maybe that castle was effective, but unless you really go above and beyond and look, you know, at the down the horizon, how else are you gonna know where you need to go or lead your people or lead your uh, church? Yeah, Alex, I am seeing this, and you may be seeing this as well too, with these educational institutions, with their big class sizes, library, everything like that. More and more of these companies, and I know you've done a lot of work with smart cities, are looking for people that they could train. You're not paying 80 grand a year for education, especially right. if you're global. Now everything is, hey, let me train you on the skills. Let me put you through a training program or a mentorship. It's a lot cheaper than paying $80,000 to a university to get a master's, right. PhD, all of that stuff. Yeah, even in the, you know, education uh, field, you know, th things are changing so quickly, right? And and even, you know, I have children who are going attending right now colleges that are saying, why am I paying $35,000 if I'm not even going to uh, school and I have to take online classes, right? My daughter just, uh, uh, you know, got into medical school and she may be going online for her first year. I'm like, she's saying, why am I paying all these money, right? Correct. So, even from a consumer perspective or, you know, the student's perspective, they're saying, you know what? Common sense doesn't, you know, cut it here. Why am I paying all this money if, if I'm not even doing this? So, yeah, yeah. And I think the biggest conversation, Alex, and is this whole idea of innovation for ministries. More and more donors I talk with want to see ministries develop a for-profit initiative. 
They say, hey, look, you're so dependent on donors. Look at what happened with the COVID. All these donors suddenly are struggling or they have to extend their giving to more ministries that are need. There's not enough funding to go around. Christian foundations don't have the flexibility during this COVID. Or can you create a for-profit initiative or something that creates additional revenue where you're not dependent on one donor or a couple of big donors? Right. So it's really time for all of us to think out of the box on then, you know, and, and pandemic brought a great challenge for all of us, including the ministries, right? What is a funding model? What is the model that we're going to embrace going forward? You know, because who knows what, if other than COVID, what else is going to hit us? You know, that's going to disrupt the way we do our ministries, right? Whether it's a war or famine or who knows what else is going to be. Yeah, I no, I, I do enjoy being in Asia a lot of times. You you've lived in Singapore for a while. I go to Jakarta. I do like the creativity of some of these churches. I mean, they are creating different where they're renting out used space, they're renting out shared space, they're right. doing different things in order to create revenue where they're not always dependent on one donation. I do like the creativity that I see all the time. Right, absolutely. And uh, you know, when you're resource constrained uh constrained. I think that's when people are forced to think out of the box. So why wait till that moment happens like pandemic or, you know, war or some other, you know, events, right? We have to think ahead again, desires and the needs of the future that we need to think through, you know, just like Joseph, you know, seven years of, you know, uh, harvest and, and famine, right? God gives us uh, our ability to think ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Alex, this is phenomenal. I love, and just to let you know, for those, this will not only be shared with our nonprofit ministry leaders in Chicago, in LA, we're going to forward it over to a couple of our groups or foundations that are asking for it to share with their ministry network. So Alex, you're, you're doing great things for the gospel. Your insight and your knowledge is so good. Well, no, thank you. Uh, you're too kind with your words, but I, if I could just help in any way with anybody's ministry, really, I'm, I'm all, for, all for it. So thank you. Yeah. For well, and even I love your example with uh, BSF and in terms of how they've moved away from or not moved away, but how they even created an app that allows them to reach more people. Right, exactly. That's a great example because five years ago when I was in China, I actually asked BSF to can we have somebody in Chongqing join us for our uh, small Bible study? They say they can't because they don't have the system in place. Well, now five years after, voila, you got this app. Now you could reach Tibet, Chongqing. It doesn't matter where you are. You know, any yeah. five people can come together and do a, a, a you know Bible study like this. Well, and that with that said, Alex, I do wonder when some of these churches are in a startup where it's all online church. So suddenly you have a teaching pastor from asia but you have attendees from africa latin america canada us all attending church together that may work one day we may see more and more of that i definitely think that's not out of the picture and especially with the younger generation uh of uh you know uh, the next generation coming up i think they will definitely see that as a much more of an op a viable option you know yeah. uh, going forward yeah hey for uh uh, did you enjoy, uh, last question as we wrap up as well too, uh, you spent a year teaching. Did you enjoy your time as a professor? Absolutely. And I uh, just love interacting with young people. And, you know, I, I learn new, new things every day just by, by their asking very intriguing questions, you know, that I never thought of. So again, you know, being open-minded and I'm learning as, as I'm teaching. So that, that was a great pleasure and honor to do that. Alex, thank you so much. And we're going to talk soon. Okay. Thank you very much. Have a nice day.